Hello, today is Wednesday, April 15th, and sadly, we are still caring for many patients infected with the coronavirus here at Silver Cross. Um, over the last few days, many people have asked about surgery and how surgery happens, especially if a patient is infected with the novel virus. So we're going to take off our masks and let me introduce um, Dr. Chris Joyce, who is the chairman of the Department of Surgery, and Dr. Philomena Verghese, who is the chairman of Department of Anesthesia. So why don't we just dig in and start with the question of emergency surgery for patients that are affected by the COVID-19 virus. Dr. Joyce, what do we do? Thanks, Ruth. So if a patient with COVID-19 needs emergency surgery, it's similar to patients who uh, don't have COVID-19 and, uh, and need emergency surgery in terms of we initially do a detailed history and physical exam, which is usually done by the primary care physician. We obtain laboratory values and imaging studies and review those. And then we get input from our consultants in pulmonary critical care and uh, infectious disease if indicated. And then as a team, uh, we decide what's best for the patient, present that to the patient and their family, go over the risks, benefits, and alternatives of the procedure, and if it's the right thing to do at that time in terms of where they are in their disease, uh, COVID-19, and where we expect them to go. If it's the right thing to go to surgery, then we contact the operating room, and Dr. Verghese and her team will then uh, take over and, and get this patient uh, ready. Okay. And what happens then, Dr. Verghese, when your team jumps in? And we do very much the same thing. We do a very thorough pre-op evaluation of any patient who comes to surgery and uh, needs anesthesia. We do uh, a, a thorough systems review. We talk to the consultants who are involved with the patient. If the patient comes from the ICU and is intubated and ventilated, then we we review the chart and talk to the patient's family about uh, risks and benefits. If the patient's awake and able to talk to us, we discuss the kind of anesthesia, general versus MAC versus regional if appropriate, and risks and benefits are explained. And this is standard operating procedure for any patient that comes okay. to us. Okay. So many people recover from COVID-19. And so it's good to know that if they need a surgery, it, that's not stopped. It may be part of their overall recovery. So yes. thank you for sharing that. Um, what about contamination in the OR? Are you worried about that, um, Dr. Verghese? Um, and good question, Ruth, because uh, I don't know how long ago it was, five weeks or something, that we all, the world, realized that we had a crisis of unprecedented proportions here. So uh, our team in the hospital, OR uh, leadership, OR management and leadership, and uh, hospital leadership, our surgical colleagues, all of us, we decided very quickly to go to a contracted OR schedule which meant we only did urgent and emergent surgeries, and uh, elective patients were all scheduled for much later on. Um, and it's for containment purposes, for preserving mm -hmm. of PPEs, for, to reduce risk of exposure. And along those lines, we prepared a COVID OR, both oh, our main special OR, OR and our OB OR, along the recommendations of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. Equipment was taken out of the room that was non-essential. HEPA filters were put in. Foot traffic is limited. We have strict protocols. PPEs are set outside the room. We have a tray of drugs that are provided to us from pharmacy for just those drugs needed for the patient so that we don't tap into our fixes. And we have an IPPR negative pressure room where we do our high-risk aerosolizing procedures, intubations, extubations, okay. recovery of the patient. Okay, All so you are goals. you are totally prepared we are. in the event that happens. And how about after surgery? Um, how do we clean the room or are you know assured that it's ready for the next patient? Well, we attempt to do these surgeries as a last case of the day uh, to allow more time to clean and sanitize oh. the room and make it safe for the next group of patients that need to come through. Um, the patients themselves, uh, they. They go either to a negative pressure room and recovery and back to the regular room or directly to the ICU to minimize exposure to our staff. Okay, good. And when you're in the OR, is there anything extra that you wear in terms of protective equipment? So normally in the OR, we wear a gown, shoe covers, a cap, and a surgical mask. Uh, for the COVID-19, uh, we wear the same types of things, but the mask has changed from a surgical mask to an N95 mask, and then we do a full face shield. Uh, to prevent contamination. Okay, good. And what about, there's lots of people in the OR besides the two of you. How about all of them? Who are they and how do we protect them? Absolutely. We 
know that every person in the room needs the same level of protection, whether it be nursing, anesthesia, our techs in the room, uh, our surgeons. So we have all the PPEs that are required for this purpose. And thank you to the hospital. They've been great with supplying mm. us all this stuff. Uh, and we've also in service people about the proper donning and doffing of PPEs. That's important because when you take it on and put it off, uh, ta- put it on and take it off, it has to be done correctly, right. so that you prevent contamination. Right, right. So, how many surgeries have we actually done over the past week, whether they're COVID sur- COVID infected patients or not? Not many, because on March seventeenth, we stopped doing all elective procedures, so we cut that back to just emergency and urgent procedures which needed to be done, and so we're down to about 20% of what we normally do. Uh, having said that, that other 80% still have medical problems that need to be addressed, and we've been trying to keep an eye on those patients. And if they become ill or their status changes, then we'll need to move those up into that urgent and emergency category. So what should somebody do if their surgery has been delayed, if that they're experiencing a lot of pain or discomfort? What would you recommend they do? First thing they do is contact their physician. Okay. Let them know what's going on because their situation may have changed. Okay. It may have gone from what we consider elective, which is a very broad category, uh, to something that needs to be done in a more timely fashion. Okay, thanks. That's important for people to know. So is there anything else you would like to say or share with people about surgery during this pandemic, Dr. Joyce? Just a shout out to my colleagues upstairs, uh, the people in the ICU that are working day and night uh, to help these patients. Uh, so. Keep, stay strong. God bless you guys, and uh, you guys rock. <laughs> How about you, Dr. Verghese? Well, you get the last word. I, um, you know, I echo everything Chris says, but I also want to add a piece, which I know you'll agree with me. Uh, these are unprecedented times, challenging times for all yeah. of us, emotionally, intellectually, physically, spiritually. And, you know, um, but with all of this, as I've seen, as I've walked into the hospital every day, and my colleagues remark about it every day, We've seen these teams of people who get together to face this challenge with grit and determination, starting with our uh, hospital leadership. We thank you for your guidance, your support, your governance, leading with a steady hand. We thank our surgical colleagues, our pulmonologists who are in the midst of it all, our ER colleagues who are front line, our amazing critical care nurses, our CRNAs, our anesthesia techs, nurses on the floor, OB nurses, they are all up close and personal with this risk yeah. in terms, but they do it every day yeah. with, uh, you know, with grit and determination. So I have to quote Simon Sinek, uh, you know, the ability of a group of people to do remarkable things hinges on how well they, they pull together mm. as a team. And we have that teamwork here at Silver. It is that secret sauce that allows ordinary right. individuals to achieve extraordinary, extraordinary results. Things. And we could not be more proud to be <laughs> part of this organization. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to put our masks back on, and thank you, both of you, for making Silver Crest such a safe place and leading the charge here. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you.